and yeah, so you'll be able to, if you don't make it to the meetups, you can actually catch them. And then this, this will actually be, you know, online as well. And I think we're gonna do an edited version where you'll have, just like we always do on the Freebug channel, uh, with uh, putting like the, yeah, the code and everything. Uh, if you guys haven't heard, I guess this is just another shameless plug. Uh, Angular Denver is coming up here soon. Uh, this is a conference that uh, we're putting on. Uh, we don't make a dime from this, just so you know. Uh, we're gonna give all the proceeds to nonprofit group. Uh, it's gonna be August 1st through 3rd. Uh, the actual conference day is on the 3rd, so that's a Friday. Uh, and then we've got um, uh, uh, workshops on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, we've got, I think, four workshops. we got NGRX, five workshops, sorry. Uh, and if I miss one, and get me here. we got NGRX, which I'm going to be doing on Thursday. Uh, Jesse, our CEO, is going to do uh, intro and advanced Angular on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, Joe Eames from Salt Lake City is coming in. He's going to be doing unit testing. He's got a great plural site course if you want to check it out as well. Um, we got NG Upgrade with Sam Julian. Uh, he's coming in from Portland, Seattle, something somewhere up there. Sweet. So if you're doing any Angular JS to Angular migrations or upgrades, I guess, um, that would be a great one to check out. And is that it, or I think, okay. Go check it out, uh, it's angulardenver.com. Uh, the price is a steal, it's only 99 bucks for a day for a conference, which is awesome. Um, I think the workshops are now $300 for the full day, which is still a deal. Uh, ng-conf, I think, is 500 So, uh, you know, again, we're just trying to give back to the community here and build something here in Denver, so. Oh, look at that. Dang it, should have looked at the slides. There you go, there's the, there's the workshops. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the last thing I get to do is just kind of give you guys a quick update on what's new with Angular, uh, kind of give you a June update. Uh, if you haven't already heard about Ivy that's coming out, uh, that's the new rendering engine in Angular. This will be the third rendering engine for Angular. Um, you can actually check out this, this uh, pretty sweet app, is Angular Ivy ready .firebase.com, uh, and you can actually see how far they're progressing through that uh, and see how close they are to getting that thing uh, released. If you didn't uh, notice on the Angular blog, uh, another team within Angular uh, kind of released a, uh, like a little demo, I guess, if you will, of a WYSIWYG prototyping tool built on Angular. Uh, it's kind of neat. Go check it out. Um, there's no actual working demo, just to be clear. There's just kind of like screenshots and stuff, uh, but it's really neat. Um, and then the next thing uh, that we're kind of uh, proud to announce as well is that actually we just... Uh, had a couple of our fantastic engineers here at Brebug write some schematics. And so, uh, I, as you may know, we're big fans of the Jest uh, test framework uh, by Facebook. Um, super fast, really lightweight, great to use. Um, and so we actually wrote a schematic to add Jest to your Angular projects. You just ng-add it, and then boom, Jest is in your project. It's really awesome. Um, and Kevin was involved in that as well as some of the other guys here it in the room. Kevin. It was just It was just Kevin, okay. Um, and then the last thing, uh, just make sure, we just kind of wanted to throw this in there in case you guys weren't aware of it. Uh, we have seen that there's been like kind of low adoption rate of this, uh, but actually using tree shakeable providers. Uh, so rather than in your ng module in the providers array, listing your, like what you're injecting, what you're providing to the dependency injection, uh, we now have tree shakeable providers in Angular 6 and use the uh, injectable decorator with provided in. Um, so if you're not doing that, you should be doing that because then you get tree shaking on that. So awesome. With that said, uh, I want to introduce you guys to Kevin. Uh, he's one of our fantastic senior engineers here at Brebug, and uh, I'll give it over to him. That was not me. I turned that off. <laughs> I can't hear out of my right ear right now, but it's all right. All right. Does everyone recover from that? <clears throat> all right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out. We're going to be talking about uh, service workers and the Angular service worker module in specific uh, and kind of talk about how we can get some offline and performance benefits. Um, so, you know, like we do with a lot of uh, technology, it's good to know why we want to adopt something. And I think this infographic is really telling. Um, on the left side, you can see that uh, in this poll, uh, the top 1,000 mobile apps versus web apps, uh, the mobile apps get about three times more uh, 
uh, traffic. But when we look at the time spent on those applications, uh, the actual um, mobile apps or the native apps uh, get much more than the mobile uh, than their website uh, companion. So um, a lot of things probably go into that, um, but service workers uh, help bridge that gap between native app uh, and web desktop experience. Um, and so. What we're going to look at tonight, I think, is going to help bridge that gap and, and give a, a better user experience um, compared to a native web uh, application. Um, a lot of things have changed in the past six months. Uh, service workers are now generally supported across all Evergreen major browsers. So this includes uh, Edge, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, as well as iOS, Safari, and uh, Chrome for Android, as well as a couple others. So it's generally safe to invest some time uh, to realize the benefits of the service worker. Um, so there's there's uh, there's definitely other ways you can implement a service worker. Um, Workbox is a really popular library uh, that'll provide a wrapper for you. Um, and uh, if you're using some other technologies, that's probably a good way to go. However, uh, Angular has its own module and set of services that they provide uh, for you to interact with the service worker. Um, and it's going to do a lot of the same things as other libraries. Um, but it's, uh, it makes it really easy to use. And so from a high level, it's going to group all of your uh, bundled files, everything, basically everything in the disk folder with a version. Um, it's going to uh, take all of those hashes and basically create a version of your application. Um, so as those uh, files changes, you'll basically, uh, in, in the service workers context, create a new version, and it'll know to update. So again, this includes all your HTML. CSS, JS, uh, JavaScript. Um, it works with the lazy loaded modules, um, so you don't really have to worry about much. Um, <clears throat> and as we'll see in a second, there's a ngsw config file that we'll uh, set things up in. And then this is going to publish a uh, ngsw json file in your disk folder. Uh, and that will get that will basically handle the communication between the service worker on the client and your configuration for the application. Um, <clears throat> I think. Understanding how a service worker updates is probably one of the most important things uh, before you start interacting with this, because it may be a little different from what you're thinking as far as uh, when I push up a change to my server and I access the web app, we're not going to see it right away. And that's for a couple reasons. Um, but we will, uh, every time we view or refresh the application, uh, Angular is going to uh, request that ngsw JSON file with a cache busting parameter. Uh, and that's going to make sure that it always gets, that's going to be the one thing. If you have your whole entire application cache, that thing's always going to be requested so that the uh, application of your client can know, uh, do I have the most latest state? Or do I need to perform an update? Or do I need to prefetch something? Has something changed in those bundled files? So that request is always going to be made. And depending on the policy for your assets, uh, the service worker will then either wait for the next request if it's a lazy prefetch, uh, or if you've told it to uh, go ahead and download those, th those things, as soon as it knows that a new version is available, you'll see those requests being made uh, in your network tab. <clears throat> and this is just a, kind of a good uh, infographic on, on, the, on the flow. So if we look at the solid lines first, this is uh, basically I have the service worker installed and things are cached. So if we have a, a performance policy, uh, we'll make a request to the service worker, and the service worker is going to sit kind of like a man in the middle uh, between our uh, our application and the network. And so everything is going to go through the service worker. Uh, and if we have this kind of performance policy where I just want the data as fast as possible, it's going to uh, check the uh, config file for the hash, realize that it has it in the cache, uh, and return that straight back to the client. Uh, and then another scenario is, say, um, Maybe I have a network first uh, or a lazy approach uh, for an asset. So it's going to check the service worker and say, OK, I'm supposed to always fetch the latest on this. So I'm going to go out to the network. Once I get that back, I'm going to put it in the cache and then send it back to the client. So there's a couple different, couple different op options uh, for your assets. But uh, the service worker is always going to sit in the middle between all these assets. So this is what uh, the Angular team provides uh, for us to interact with the service worker, and it makes it really easy. Uh, they provide two services. One is uh, SW Update, and obviously that's going to be for all of your service worker interactions. So anytime you have a 
um, an update to the service worker, this service is going to handle that. And there's also a SW push. So if you want to um, interact with push notifications, well, they also provide that uh, service as well. Um, and we'll, conf we'll configure everything in this ngsw config file uh, and adding it. Of course, if you use the CLI, you can do ng add PWA. And this will handle a lot of it for you, but this line here in your in your root module is be, will be where you will um, configure and initiate or instantiate the service worker module. So you'll just pass it the file, and um, also we will enable it only for production as well. So a lot of the integrity uh, again relies on those hashes to know when the file has changed. Um, so we we'll want to only typically run this with a production build and not with the typical ng serve. <clears throat> uh, so in this config file, which we'll see in a bit, uh, there's really two main groups uh, that we're going to configure our assets in. Uh, one is labeled assets groups. And these, again, are going to be your, uh, your core files that you're working with, so your HTML, JS, and CSS, Fabricon, et cetera. Basically, anything that gets a hash and dumped into the dist file, dist folder. Um, <clears throat> and based on all those uh, hashes and those files, that will determine the uh, application version and when it updates. Um, and there's two, two modes uh, that are important to know about. Um, prefetch and lazy. Uh, lazy. Uh, so uh, prefetch is just like it sounds. Uh, if you're telling that this asset needs to be uh, in the uh, service worker, it will go ahead and fetch that before it's ever been hit. Whereas lazy waits for you to request it before it puts it in the cache. And you can specify um, that interaction for both the install mode uh, and the update mode. So whenever you make a change, you can say, I want this to, that's great, we've got a change, but you know what, just wait till the next request. So I'm going to do a lazy update mode. Uh, the second group that we're going to configure is the data groups. And for these uh, policies, these are going to be like your API requests. So things that, are, that exist outside of your dist folder. Um, this will be your backend server, basically things that don't have a hash or a version to them. Um, and they're generally going to be cached according to the um, HTTP uh, caching policies that are applied from that server. Uh, but they give a similar uh, configuration uh, like we saw before. So we can do a performance where we uh, specify a max age and say that uh, once this is requested, uh, I want to use this version for the next seven days, or seven hours, or year, however long you define it. Um, and on the inverse of that, we can say uh, this is crucial to our application functioning, that we have the latest data. So I want, we to, I want you to always hit the network. Uh, but in this case, we can define a timeout uh, property and say, I always, I always want you to hit the network, but if this thing takes long, longer than two seconds, fall back to the cache. Uh, and it makes it really easy to, to set these up. <clears throat> uh, like I said earlier, uh, in those uh, data groups, this is going to be your unhashed content where you're going to set up those policies. Um, and it still caches, but again, it honors the HTTP caching headers. Um, and when it expires, it'll just follow the normal flow of serving it from the cache and refresh in the background. <clears throat> Uh, they put a lot of work and thought into maintaining the integrity of your application because it's pretty easy to, to envision how your app can get out of sync when you have these different versions. And maybe I change one file, like my, my index or something.html or, or my home component, and now my main bundle is different, something like that. Um, so again, like I said, uh, all those files are hashed. Those hashes make up the version in the uh, service worker. And uh, every time your application loads, uh, it always fetches, fetches uh, that config file with the cache busting URL. And if that fails, the um, service worker will invalidate that entire version of the app. So the next load, you'll just get a fresh download from the network. It'll bypass it. And they also have some safe modes. So you can, um, you know, if things get really hairy, it can, you know, enter itself into a safe mode. You can also programmatically do this by changing the name of the, I believe it's the, uh, the config file. You can either remove it or change the name. It'll basically just kind of self-destruct and get out of its own way. I think that talked into my next slide here. Um, so yeah, remove or rename that uh, config file uh, in the service worker will deregister itself. Uh, or if any time that that 
uh, that file that it cache bus returns a 404, uh, it'll just remove the cache and, and deregister itself. And uh, one of the things they also offer is a new route for your application. So if you uh, go to your application and go to ngsw slash state, you can get uh, some kind of low-level debug information of how is a service worker functioning at this moment. So you can get version information, uh, the state of it, uh, the last hash, those sorts of things. All right, so we're going to look at a quick demo um, and kind of see how some of this stuff is set up. Bert's going to show you. So this is the app we're going to be looking at. This is the uh, this is public. You guys can look at it later. Um, very simple. Um, <clears throat> really, two views here. This one is just static. So we're just going to look at like, like what are the what are the default files that, that our application is going to download, and then this one has some uh, dynamic data that we're going to be looking at, both a uh, API payload, and then these images are going to be our kind of uh, dynamic, say, important things that we don't want to cache. So we'll look at how to how to set these all up and what's going on. So <clears throat> I've got uh, this uh, demo uh, running right here. I just ran a, a ng build prod, basically, to hash all the files. Uh, and then I'm serving it uh, statically from the file system. Um, so if we access our little application here, everyone see that OK? Good. Cool. Um, so we can see that. Making a lot of requests here. Um, we can see the size of the assets. We've got our hash content over here on the left. And um, this is kind of a clean, this, is the, this will be the first load, or the first um, view of this application. And so our um, service worker has installed. So if we, when we come back the second time, uh, that's when the service worker is going to be enabled. Uh, and we can see that these files are now being called from the service worker. We're only downloading about 3.1K here. Um, so the uh, <clears throat> if we go back and look uh, at our config file, uh, we can see we're, we're specifying the index, uh, and we see our asset groups right here. Uh, so each group requires a unique name, and we have the install mode of prefetch. So it's going to whether it's requested or not, uh, these resources uh, are going to be prefetched so that they're ready. And we've got a second group down here called assets, so anything that's in the assets folder. Uh, right now, we have this set to lazy, so we're only going to download these uh, as needed, just kind of like a normal flow. Uh, however, updates are going to be prefetched. So when we say that there's an update, uh, when our service worker realizes that, it's going to go ahead and download those. Um, so again, we hit it the first time, the service worker installed. Second time we come back to the visit, the service worker takes over and proxies those requests and says, hey, I already, I already cached these the first time. Uh, and it's just going to serve it straight from the cache. So uh, let's come over here. And uh, we are going to add uh, some URLs. I'm going to close this sidebar so we can see. We're going to add some, uh, some of the basic Google fonts. Um, to our uh, assets here. And uh, the <clears throat> CLI provides a good way to kind of test these changes out really quickly. Instead of redoing a prod build every time, uh, you can just run um, this ngsw config module uh, and pass it the directory to the where the uh, disk folder is outputted to and the config file. And that'll basically generate a new service worker config. So we're just updating that in our local static server. And I messed up the JSON. Probably. Was it not like? I'm going to set this one. 
this. There we go. I don't need that. All right. So pretty quick to update package JSON. Uh, so this is like, hey, we've published a new version of our application. Uh, I'm going to close this out. I'm going to come back later to my app. Uh, and we can see that, look down here in a second. Uh, here's our cache busting request for that config. Uh, and we can see that it uh, went ahead and prefetched all these uh, apps here. And um, reload, we can see that now everything is being served from the service worker, from our default route. It's a little bigger here. So all of our assets are now cached. We're not making a network. The only network request we're making every time is this cache busting request. Um, so next, we're going to look at uh, our little launches page here. Um, and if we hit this, we can see that uh, we have this launches API request. And this is just all our JSON for all these all these SpaceX launches. And um, so what we're going to do to handle that is we're going to add a data group. And again, we're going to give it a unique name. This is kind of our, our ID. Uh, we're going to pass the URLs that we want to cache, so anything at this uh, path. Uh, we're going to choose a performance strategy. So it's always going to check the cache first. And <clears throat> we're just going to store one of these requests and we're going to store it for seven days. And they actually provide a pretty unique way. You can just do like seven minutes, seven hours. You can do 30 minutes. They provide kind of like a little DSL for uh, deciding how long you want to cache something. So we're going we're gonna to cache this API request for seven days because in our, in our app, we know this, this isn't going to change. Uh, and we're also going to provide a fallback image. So if we go offline and these uh, badges these badges we're kind of treating as like uh, really critical uh, data. We always want to we always want to request that first. Uh, but in some case, if that's not, we're going to go ahead and say it's prefetch in our assets folder. We're just going to download ahead of time so that it's available and ready for our application. I'm going to uh, update our service worker config file. Uh, we're going to simulate that we come back at a later date. <clears throat> we will get our uh, cash busting request on there. And uh, so our uh, service worker is updated. Again, we'll need to come back the second time to get the update, the actual implementation of that update. And let's see here. So now, since we since we cached all those assets, uh, I have this little fallback image in here. So you can see as we toggle back between online and offline, uh, we can see that uh, we have a fallback image in place. So that image uh, exists in our assets directory right here. So we went ahead and prefetched that uh, by changing this from lazy to prefetch. And we can also look at our uh, launches API, and if we hit this again, we can see that now it's being served from the network, from the service worker, I'm sorry. Uh, so at this point, we've configured all of the dist files, uh, we figured our API, uh, and the only thing we're still uh, manually requesting time are these badges. So those are the only network requests that we're making in this scenario. Um, so that's kind of the demo, demo app. Uh, I'd like to show you guys um, how the service is set up. Uh, so if we go down here to the app status service. So we can see we're injecting the service worker update uh, service from that module. So it's coming from the service worker. Uh, and it provides a couple methods. One of them is available. Uh, so anytime that a new version is available, we can execute this uh, method here that we're uh, using it as a callback. And so if we have an event available, I've just set up a little behavior subject that we can expose to the rest of the application, and we're just nexting the new hash to the application. So 
this is how you can kind of programmatically tell your users, hey, you're, you're using an outdated version of the application. Would you like to update? Uh, and we can see that you, might, you may have saw that um, uh, on a couple of refreshes. But if I just change one thing here, publish a new config, and then we'll revisit. Um, we'll see we get the request for the new JSON. And now we have a new um, refresh button, update available at this hash. So we can programmatically prompt the user to update their application, get the new service worker, get the new code. Uh, <clears throat> another thing is they provide a method for sort of like that. Um, Notifying the app when a uh, new version is uh, loaded automatically and uh, activating a new update. So this is how we're, we're reloading the app. We're calling activate update, uh, which just posts a message to the service workers uh, inner scoped. And then we're just doing a simple uh, you know, document.reload. Uh, I'm also in this demo just exposed uh, when an update is available. So this is when we're calling next on that behavior subject. So we can key off of that. And then uh, the fallback image is keyed off of this online observable. So we're looking at a couple things, uh, the global online uh, method, as well as the window.offline and, and setting that here. So that way we can uh, toggle this and have this respond dynamically as the app switches online and offline. If you want to show a, some sort of fallback or some sort of indication that, hey, this app is not going to function correctly, we'll resync when you join online <clears throat> in the future. And I think, uh, again, here's that, uh, here's that loading button. I've just exposed this as a public member. So when it's available, uh, we're going to show that refresh button. And when you click on it, we're just going to call reload for this example. And uh, for the launches page, with all those launches there, um, we have a online status that's just subscribing um, to our app status service. And uh, we just make a simple request to get the, uh, get the uh, JSON payload. And then our image is keyed off of that online observable. And so if we're online, we can show the dynamic mission patch. Otherwise, we fall back to the uh, default asset. Um, and that's uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, we can lo also look in our dist folder. Um, this is what gets published. So when that uh, in this ng let's split screen this here um, on the left is where we do our configuration, and on the right is what gets um, published every time and, and downloaded by the service worker. And this is used to uh, indicate when a new version is available. So it's taking all these hashes into account. Uh, it's it's indicating all the asset URLs to prefetch. Uh, it's got our patterns for our uh, fonts. And here's our uh, API request that we are uh, utilizing. And then we have this um, big hash table of how it's keeping track of what thing, when things change and when it needs to update. So um, that. All right. Uh, that's a quick demo on the service worker module, how you can use it, how easy it is to configure. Um, it's pretty straightforward to at least get your app shell cached by the service worker, things that aren't changing that often, maybe your sidebar, nav bar, just the defaults. Um, you can at least not make your clients pay for that download uh, every time. Uh, and when there are downloads, it's pretty straightforward to manage uh, getting the latest data as well. Uh, and lastly, a couple links on here. Uh, there's some interesting things on uh, how much uh, data you can store in a service worker. So every client's a little bit different. Um, so if you are, uh, if you have a lot of data that is necessary to be there, you want to be uh, cognizant of that and uh, what what uh, devices that your clients are using. Um, this is a pretty interesting link. This will, whatever you look at this in, this will show you what features are available uh, on your clients. So it's kind of you can run this in Chrome and Firefox, Safari and see what, uh, what's being supported. Uh, Lighthouse is a really good tool uh, for testing and benchmarking your app. So it tests a lot of things. One of those things is 
uh, the service worker in specific uh, specifically. And, uh, you know, that's uh, more kind of going towards a, a full on progressive web app, um, but still a service worker on its own implementation uh, provides a lot of benefit. You're looking to test a uh, service worker. Interestingly enough, Pinterest has a uh, what looks, I haven't tested this uh, myself, but they look like they have figured out a lot of how to test uh, service workers. Um, so that's a good, good thing to know. And then I've got the link to the uh, demo on here. If you guys want to take a look. Yeah, question. <clears throat> Do you think you can run one with species protection or ID browser? I don't have. Don't have ID. No, it's Mac. Sorry. Yeah. So if we come back. So would you know? You know. Um, I, he's not looking good, but. Uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, there's hope for Edge. Where, where can you find this? Um, so we will post. I will post uh, these slides in some more fashion. We'll post it on the Meetup page, or I'm sure we'll put it on our Twitter or something like that. Um, and yeah, a lot of these other ones down here were uh, just resources that I used to to put the presentation okay. together. So it looked like that that global. Online, designs that are true or false. What do you do about like Starbucks? Like, internet, like, internet, internet? Um, so you're like quasi, you're doing like in and out, or like the connection speed is really slow. Well, that that online uh, piece was let's see. online piece was a collection of these properties. So I guess it would depend on. How these are interacting with, you know, if if your if your network is actually dropping in Starbucks in and out, then I would imagine that these would switch on and off on time. Uh, slow connection. I don't know if these would fire or not. I, mean, I don't know if there's a way you could programmatically watch that from inside the application. But yeah. So. Um, yeah. There's in the network tab. There's an offline button here. So we're under network. Up here on the top, there's offline. Uh, and that'll. Oh, yeah. Oh, slow down the network. Yeah. Like the slowest. Yeah, I was just wondering what, once you slow it down, you know. Yeah, so let's uh, we can we can unregister the service worker. I imagine too if you're having slow intermittent internet, you can just put a set timer if offline for five seconds. <clears throat> Still fast enough, I guess. Is there a Starbucks? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it won't pack up. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's not a lot. It's pretty small. Yes, you'd have to. A way in the framework to say, hey, it just takes longer than 10 seconds. Yes. Okay, so you can actually. Yeah, so uh, we can say. So these two, these two kind of go hand in hand. So when you have a performance strategy, you would set the max age property. So we're saying, uh, pull this from the cache. Uh, from when it's instantiated to the net for the next seven days. After that, uh, default it. So if we, I think it's, if we do lazy, uh, this becomes uh, timeout. And we say, uh, you know, try this for 20, you know, two and a half seconds. If that takes longer than two and a half seconds, then it's going to fall back to the cache. So you would just inverse those properties if you wanted to apply a policy for those assets. You mean fall back to the default? 
a little awkward. Um, you could configure. You could. You could configure it that way. Although, if, if uh, I would imagine, if you once this lands the first time, it's going to put it in the cache as like a backup, whatever the actual uh, request, the response is. And then in this case, it's going to say, uh, "Go to the network." It's going to fail. It's going to just hold that stale response. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Um, when it comes to choosing what goes in the asset group, what do you typically decide that on? Uh, like which which one is it go data group versus asset group? Uh, well, just asset groups for now. Um, you have multiple groups. How do you what do you use to determine as to what makes a group a group? Okay. Like, there's the home page in St. Louis first, and then maybe there's a product page. Maybe then there's an asset group for every asset on the product page. Yeah, you could break it down like that. It, it, it's yeah, I think features is probably one good way to look at it. Um, you know, if you, if you have uh, a bunch of lazy loaded uh, assets, like maybe we don't want to download those things. Maybe it's like almost a whole other app to itself. So let's let's silo those. Let's only download those as necessary. Um, or maybe they're pertinent. You just don't want to like make the user wait. Uh, so then you can say, okay, let's uh, for for these set of assets, let's create a policy uh, that prefetches them. Right, we don't need them, but and that's what we did with the the rocket asset. Essentially, is that um, if it was lazy and we went offline, well, I've never downloaded that asset, so it would fail. It wouldn't show up. So in order for it to be ready for the offline mode, that's why I changed it to prefetch. So I went ahead and downloaded it, so it was ready. <laughs> that's good questions. Any more questions? Yeah. I guess I don't know if it's a chance, but then if you go back the other way, if you have a whole bunch of things that are being interacted with the app, it's really like store the changes that are making and then sync them back to the server that's working on the front end. Yeah, I mean, I think you could, uh, you know, whether that's a API request. You know, we can, we can store these things. We can, we can refresh uh, programmatically, like I showed, by, by um, Making this publicly available, we can present them with a, hey, this, things are about to change. Do you want to change them? Uh, so we could maybe save that to the database. Maybe we so, save it to local storage, um, something like that. So I think any, any sort of storage mechanism that persists, uh, you could probably just dump it in there and then just have your app read from it every load. Like, is, is there anything in there? Cool. Any more questions? Awesome. I appreciate you guys coming out. Um, yeah, thank you. We'll put all this stuff online.